Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this important program about the future of physical workspaces as uh, the, the economy begins to reopen, especially for our, for our downtown office-based uh, employers. Uh, we do have a couple of poll questions that we'd like you to respond to, if you will, before we start our, our program. Uh, your responses will really help the Downtown Council shape future programming over the coming weeks and months as we stay in this virtual world. So if you could take a couple of minutes to respond and submit, then a little after four o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started with the program. Thank you very much. All right, again, thank you for joining us. My name is Steve Kramer. I'm the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and our virtual panel and discussion uh, this afternoon is about the future of physical workspaces. Uh, I always wanna start these days by wishing you well. I hope you're, you and your family and your work colleagues are, are, are healthy and, and staying uh, engaged during, during this incredible time that we're living through. Um, but we are very much looking forward to to seeing you downtown when it uh, makes sense for for you to be back uh, be back in the office or back back at work, um, we are continuing to collect resources and information that uh, I hope will be helpful to everyone who's uh, a member or associated with the downtown council. And you can find that information at mplsdowntown.com/slash/covid-19. Uh, feel free to pass that link on to your colleagues and. Uh, uh, and uh, clients. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to go through just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, uh, so uh, as we get into our webinars, as you know, all of our, all of our participants are at the mercy of their Wi-Fi connections and the reliability of our technology, which to date has been holding up just fine. But uh, if, if there's any discontinuity there, we'll deal with it as best we can. Uh, this conversation will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel you'd like to share it or, or watch it again later. Uh, and please feel free to introduce yourself on the chat function so we know who, who is here and, and your, your company. And also, if you have a question, we very much encourage that as we go along here, please use the Q&A function and uh, we'll certainly try to get to as many questions as we can during the course of our, during the course of our program. So we do have a, a few upcoming uh, additional programs that I would like to, to, to highlight. Uh, see those coming up on the screen here, I hope, in a moment. Okay, on May 28th, we're going to continue our series on, on back to work and uh, talk about operating under the influence of COVID-19. So we've identified a number of uh, experts in different sectors, uh, retail, restaurant, and the like, who will talk a little bit about uh, what what it's going to be like in those sectors to, to come back as we also balance uh, the economy and the ongoing need for, for public health concerns to, to sust sustainably get our economy back, back on track. So uh, that'll be an interesting session on the 28th. Um, similarly, on, the, on June 11th, we'll talk to a number of people in other parts of the country who probably are a little bit ahead of where we are given the, the, the the curve of the pandemic in terms of coming back and reanimating downtowns just to see what kind of tips and information they might have gleaned that will be helpful for us here in Minneapolis uh, as we also journey down that path. And then finally, on June 18th with our 
our partners at the East Town Business Partnership, kind of remind ourselves again of the importance of downtowns to the to the city as a whole and to our into our our region. So those will all be, I hope, for you interesting programs if you're able to to join us. You can uh, register for all of those programs on mplsdowntown.com. I really wanna thank DLR Group for sponsoring our discussion uh, uh, today. And we're gonna hear from uh, uh, Janice Linster, a principal at DLR here in a moment. All of our panelists, let me introduce them and then we'll go to Janice and then we'll ask a series of questions. Got a great group today. Uh, Kevin Anderson, who is the Enterprise Sales Director at Common Grounds Workplace. Chris Hudson, who's the Editor-in-Chief at Archi Architecture Minnesota Magazine at the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota. Carrie Awanak, who is the Office Manager at 8x8. Eight Mentioned Janice Linster, who's Principal at DLR Group. Dave Wright, Director of Management Services at Newmark Knight Frank. And then Dana Grady, our Events uh, Coordinator, is uh, sort of behind the scenes helping to manage the logistics of our program. So, I want to thank all of those panelists for joining us today. And Janice, we're going to kick it off with you from DLR Group. Again, thank you for your sponsorship and really look forward to you setting the stage for our, for our discussion today. So take it away. For uh, orchestrating our, um, our panel, our conversation this afternoon. Um, really appreciate this opportunity. I know that I personally am grateful to be able to share some insights and some tactics. I know my fellow panelists as well. Hopefully we can provide some uh, broader help to the business community as we all look at stepping back into our, our office spaces. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm gonna set the stage for what we're gonna be talking about this afternoon. Um, and the first thing I wanna mention is many of us may be speaking of um, aspects of, of strategies in terms of short-term and long-term. There's not a black and white line in between any of this. Um, uh, there, there's sort of gray territory, but it's very important that we, we think like that. I think um, from a short-term standpoint, there are some uh, critical things that we need to be thinking about. And most importantly, we need to be thinking about um, taking actions very quickly, um, uh, e easy decisions that we can make, um, uh, and hopefully things that are less expensive in the long run. I think what we all respect and understand is there's no roadmap for this, um, and, um, and there's no manual, there's no, no printed manual for us either. So there's a likelihood that we'll be making decisions and we'll have to evaluate those, and there's a good chance that we may be making changes at some point along the way as well. Again, that could, could apply to both the long-term and the short-term. A couple of other things that we need to recognize from the short-term standpoint, I think very importantly, we want to, um, uh, we want to look at uh, uh, aspects that will instill confidence, that will mitigate fear, um, we really want to look at preparing our office environment so that employees feel comfortable coming back to work. I think it's very interesting, the timing of this presentation, that we're sitting here in week one and day two of our state's um, restrictions being lifted. And so many companies have um, uh, already started the back to work. I think, however, that's going to be a slow integration. I know ourselves at DLR Group, um, we're looking at a June 1st back to work, but we'll have less than 20% of our workforce. I think in the short term that will benefit us all because we'll be able to adapt to some changes and norms in a greater way. And obviously, we'll also be able to spread out better and practice social distancing etiquette. From a long-term perspective, there is no doubt that the circumstances that we have been through will have an effect on us as businesses long-term. Um, it will have an effect on our personal lifestyles. Uh, it, this will have an effect on our work styles and our work styles will have an effect somehow on the design of our office environments. Likewise, the design of our, of our office environments will have some sort of impact perhaps on our real estate footprint. Um, and many other things that, that we can see uh, integrating from a long-term perspective, whether it be enhanced mechanical systems, enhanced technologies, et cetera. I think, um, you know, bottom line from a long-term, it's very important that, um, you know, that businesses are thinking proactively and imagining um, what might change for their businesses. And just like the short-term, this will be an evolution as well. 
So now bringing this back to the workforce and to the workplace, there are several things as panelists that we identified that we'll be speaking about back and forth today. And I'll just identify a few of those um, big picture and, um, and then like I said, we'll be getting into more detail on these things. So the first one, um, and Dana, if you could hit the next slide for us, please. Um, the first one is protocols and rules. Um, I think if a business doesn't have this in place already, it is extremely important that there's some documentation. It could be two pages or 20 pages. I, I've seen it all, but some sort of documentation that addresses what's going to change day one when we come back to work. Well, we need to address social distancing and whether or not we're, we're required to wear masks or personal protection. How, do we, how are we supposed to act in conference rooms? Is it closed doors or open doors? Is the microwave going to be working? Is the coffee maker going to be working? So many, many different um, uh, protocols and rules, so to speak. And I think the CDC and the World Health are great resources for this. And by this point, there's probably some, some, a number of templates to reference as well. And then from there, it's really um, focusing on frequent communications, not just to those coming back to work, but obviously our, our office as a whole. Uh, the next element is well-being. This certainly has been something that has been on our minds during, um, you know, during this two months of, I, I call it the crash course in, in working from home. And um, it, there's been many good things that have come from this, many things that we've learned about how we might work better at home or in the office. But there's also been an element of stress um, uh, embedded at all, in all of this. And I think the unknown um, the, the not knowing where the end date of this is also causes some stress. And so we just need to keep that in mind as we're thinking of our workforce and making sure that we're providing ongoing support for that as well. And then um, when we look at office design and planning, and, and certainly there'll be both long-term and short-term um, adjustments and responses that we'll make to our current circumstances. And we'll talk about this today in a few different ways from a tenant perspective, from a, a building landlord perspective, and then also from a, a co-working perspective. Um, similarly, um, sanitization, um, uh, again, uh, we'll speak to aspects of this at different levels, but at the very basic level, we know that there'll be um, a heightened attention to more cleaning, more maintenance, but I think also a very big part of this is personal ownership, and each of us need to take accountability for um, the health and, and cleaning in our environments. Um, HVAC, we'll touch on that a bit. Certainly clean air is a big part of the conversation that has taken place today. Again, uh, within tenant spaces, within building spaces, there are buildings that are very set for this. They have newer systems, more robust systems, and they'll be able to optimize air in a, in a very easy way and make tweaks uh, initially. For other properties, it may be about some initial enhancements, and then long term, it might be a look at investments in some greater systems, systems since this is a very important aspect to our overall environment. And then um, technology is the other aspect that we'll be speaking to. Um, technology tools, um, oh my goodness, have certainly been a part of our lives these past couple of months. And um, one of our panelists, Carrie, will be speaking to aspects of software and hardware that will continue to influence our lives. And then beyond that, I think we, we have to expect that a greater immersion of technology overall, Bluetooth, touchless, face recognition, voice recognition, um, monitor sensors will very much become more and more a part of our commercial work environments. Um, these, this technology exists today. It, it, for some companies, it's very much a part of their culture. Uh, for other companies, it's, it's, not, it, it's not at all been introduced. So again, we should expect to see more of that. Um, and certainly privacy and security will be a part of that. Before I pass it back, Steve, to you, I just, I just want to say that in all of this, the thing that we need to keep in our minds is that all of these elements um, work in concert together. If we just pick one of them, um, we won't be able to meet uh, the entire picture. So we need to kind of um, take a look at how we can achieve aspects of all of these. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you to get us rolling on our conversation. Super. Thank, thank you, Janice. That was a great setting of the stage. And it, it is indeed a complex endeavor that people are beginning to take on, but helpful uh, resources like the DLR, DLR group will, will 
make sure that we get through it. So thanks again. Um, Chris, I'm going to start the, the panel's questions with, with you. Uh, you edited an architecture magazine, so you talk to uh, architects about their work all over the city, all over the region, all over the, the state. Kind of in, this, in this space of, of kind of back to office, back to work, kind of what, are you, what are you hearing? What are people talking about and what are the concerns and what kind of resources can you perhaps offer our audience after you answer that question that might be helpful on an ongoing basis? Chris? Chris, are you there? We need to get you unmuted, Chris. Do you have any luck there, Mary Beth? There we go. Are we all set? Chris, you hear me, Steve? Or the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and Janice, thank you for that excellent uh, introduction of all the things we need to be uh, thinking about and all the things that have to be working in concert, uh, both uh, short term and long term, with our return to the uh, workplace. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. Uh, in answer to the question, uh, the first question, Steve, yes, Architecture Minnesota is published by the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota, here in Minneapolis. So I've had an ear on these conversations, both as um, editor of the magazine and as a member of a staff team that's been working on a number of fronts to share guidance from architects and designers on a range of considerations for reopening businesses and other um, spaces that accommodate the public. Um, in my limited time here, and since I'm kind of at the beginning, I thought I'd focus on a few basic spatial and environmental solutions for maintaining proper physical distancing in shared spaces, things architects are talking about. Um, and also reducing contact with shared surfaces and materials. For most uh, workplaces where employees are concentrated in work areas, uh, physical distancing will obviously require spacing out of usable uh, workstations um, and repurposing some meeting and lounge spaces, lounge spaces for individual workspaces. Uh, this kind of work is second nature to workplace designers. They, they know how to assess and calculate and make the um, most economical adjustments for reduced capacity including with the added wrinkle of phased returns, uh, alternating schedules, and staggered start times for employees. Um, the thing you're seeing on your screen here is something I'll be getting to uh, shortly. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen a sample office floor plan with color-coded marks indicating properly separated workstations. Um, some of those sam uh, sample plans uh, show altered circulation paths as well. Uh, for instance, uh, converting narrower corridors and stairwells to one-way circulation so employees don't have to pass each other too closely. Uh, effective signage and other visual cues will be needed to help employees and visitors learn the new ways of moving about the office. And, and especially with circulation and signage, it's vitally important to keep people with disabilities in mind. Uh, a person who is blind or has a phys physical or mobility disability, for example, may be acutely impacted by changes made to workplace navigation. Other items, workplaces, uh, other, I'm sorry, other items workplace architects and designers are focused on include ways of keeping visitors and employee interactions with visitors near the entry uh, and helping clients create protocols for service provider access and for um, safer receiving and handling of deliveries. Kitchens, uh, kitchens and cafeterias, I'm, I'm sure other panelists will weigh in on this. Uh, the hope is that uh, most employees will be willing to reduce um, perhaps even forego their need for the office refrigerator and microwave in some cases in the near future in the service of safety. But there are certainly kitchen use and sanitation protocols that can work. Um, one interesting idea I've seen is to equip every employee with a, a backpack with all the things they need during the workday, a laptop, mouse, mobile, um, uh, non-refrigerated food and drink, hand sanitizer, PPE, um, it's an idea that limits and localizes what employees need to touch in the course of their work, and, and it might give staff um, who are anxious an extra level of control. Uh, so architects are talking about in refining a number of ideas and solutions, and they're, and they're doing so in conversation uh, with their clients because their clients know their businesses and, and their people and their culture and their unique challenges right now um, better than anybody. Uh, the last thing I, I'll note right now, and I think, um, uh, Janice kind of hinted at this in her intro, but the lifting of the stay-at-home uh, stay order 
um, low cost makeshift measures like tape on the floor and improvised dividers between workstations. I think those will be welcome signs that businesses have their employees and visitors well being foremost in mind. Um, but if the threat stretches out for some time, as it may, uh, those measures may need to be more visually integrated into the workplace. In other words, um, feel more thought out in a more natural part of the work environment. Uh, that will assure staff and visitors of their safe, safety in the space in the long term. And that's where we get further into the future of the physical workspace. Steve, did you want me to jump into the, the free resource? I, I yeah, pl please, please do. I know I, I, any ongoing resource people can access, I'm sure would be welcome. So please do, Chris. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of these, obviously, a number of resources that can be uh, gotten online. Uh, one of the first things that uh, uh, architecture firms that specialize in workplace design uh, did was assemble some free resources. Um, uh, guides and roadmaps and checklists as best as they can be uh, assembled right now, uh, knowing that things will evolve. Um, guides on how to approach reopening offices as quickly and safely as possible. Um, you can find a number of quality materials like these online and I'm, I'm sure many of the folks in our audience already have. The one I'd want to single out is the AIA's reoccupancy re assessment tool. And sorry, this has been on the screen for a while. Um, this is a tool that was created for businesses and civic leaders by the American Institute of Architects. It offers a streamlined framework of strategies for reoccupying buildings and businesses that are transitioning from being fully closed to fully open. Importantly, uh, the framework cues from the CDC's hierarchy of controls uh, for controlling exposure to occupational hazards. After social is isolation, which we've been doing a lot of, uh, the highest priority in the hierarchy is physical controls, everything from fixtures and furnishings to ventilation. Below that is administrative controls, um, policies and procedures, and then comes providing occupants with PPE. Um, uh, to kind of dig into this just a little bit, uh, for non-essential businesses, the tool invites users to mark the individual strategies um, as either essential or desirable for their workplace in um, each of two stages of reoccupancy. Restricted occupancy when physical distancing measures uh, limit the capacity of a space or a workplace, and full occupancy. And what makes the tool so user-friendly is that it's not an encyclopedia of information and instructions. It's about as concise and clear uh, an overview as you can get uh, given the complexity of the challenge that, that awaits us. Um, its strategies and priorities apply to a number of different workplaces. I, I highly recommend people give it a look. A simple Google, Google search for reoccupancy assessment tool will get you to the right page. Um, and just really quickly, one last thing. One other resource that I can tell um, you, our audience about is a series of webinars that um, AI Minnesota, my employer, is facilitating over the next few weeks on the future of design in the wake of the public health crisis. Um, each session will focus on a particular building type with presentations by uh, industry leaders and architects, followed by you know, a, a Q&A, much like this program. Uh, the session this audience might be most interested in is titled Rework Workplace, Office Space Design and Operation in the Context of COVID-19. Uh, that program is scheduled for this Friday morning at nine o'clock, May 22nd, runs for an hour and a half. Um, and uh, I don't know that we have the URL here, but um, um, anyone who has a, uh, wants to uh, put a chat or a question in, we can make sure you get that URL for, for how to learn more about the program and register. Thank you, Chris. I, Everybody, I want to let you know that Dana did just put the URL right in perfect. the chat, so you can just link from there. Yep. Thank you. I'm, I'm signed up for that one, and uh, we'll also talk later about sharing some of these slides, because I know a couple of other presenters have slides. So, Chris, thank you very much. Dave Wright, let me, let me go to you, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to ask you the question we talked about, but let me first start for the Newmark Knight uh, Frank assets that you all are responsible for. What, what, what do you think this pace of return is going to be? Uh, Dave, do you have a sense for that yet, based on what Janice and Chris were saying, sort of this slow repopulation? Sure, absolutely. Good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we do have a pretty good sense, and we actually, and I've been involved in a, in a lot of conversations with our tenants, uh, primarily here at 50 South 6, but at, at our other properties as well. And, you know, our approach here is let's listen. Let's find out what's in their head. Let's find out what they're thinking. And the emotions are running all over the board. There are some people who are, are just very afraid of coming back. There are some that are ready to move on and really want to get back and they want to get the energy going. They want some sense of, of normal. 
Uh, there are some that are, well, you know, I'll, I'll come back to work, but I'm going to be there from 8 to 4.30. I'm not going to leave my cubicle, and, and I'm going to do everything I can to just make it through the day. And it, it's, a, it's a mix of emotions. And one of the things that I've learned in some of the discussions is that when people start coming back to work, we are starting to understand and we're starting to work with the fact that the minute that these people get out of bed the morning that they come back to work, they're going to be stressed out. They're going to be stressed out from the standpoint that they still have kids that are home that are distant learning. They've got that on their mind. They've got kids that, that wouldn't normally be home during the day. And now all of a sudden, it's a little stressful for them to think, how, how are we going to make those adjustments? There's a lot of people that have said to me, you know, my biggest fear is not the office building, but it's getting on mass transit because I can't come downtown and park. And so I have to get on a train or I have to get on a bus and I'm really worried about that. So at the end of the day, the, the cards are sort of stacked against the building the minute that they walk in because they're already uh, e emotionally involved in the day. And, and a lot of people I've talked to are far more worried about the, the trip to work than walking in the front door. Once they get in the front door, they, they start to ask questions and they want a lot of specific answers about things. And Janice hit on this remarkably well in her intro comments. Uh, what are you doing about the cleaning? What are you doing about the, about the mechanical systems? How do I know that you've done everything that you can do to make the building safe? So we really are paying attention to the tenants we really want to understand what they're thinking. There's only so much that we as, as owners and building managers can do. Uh, certainly employers slash tenants will need to take some responsibility in that reentry as well. But by talking to tenants, by talking to the employers, by listening to what they have to say and then modeling our readiness plan uh, around that, I think puts a little bit more ease in, in front of people. Yeah. Well, they build on that a little bit in with respect to some of the amenities that buildings have been installing. I mean, uh, he, before COVID-19, I always have described it as a little bit of an arms race. You know, who can have the, the newest and best fitness center? What are the co these beautiful common spaces that are being created in, our, in many of our buildings downtown? What, you know, what, what will that, how will that impact the reentry of tenants? What, what are they thinking about those kinds of spaces? Well, that's a great question. If we go back, think about the last several years and think about the, the building owners and the investments that they've made in their buildings for amenities and, and other things that, that employees want. And Mary Beth, if you can, can go up to the, the new mark slide, I can play a little bit off of that. So building owners over the last several years have tried to position their properties where they can help design a space for tenants that will not only uh, attract and retain top talent, promote wellness, it, it enables productivity, engages employees. That was all part of what tenants have been asking us building owners and managers for years. And we've responded by uh, retrofitting buildings, remodeling buildings. And Steve, to your point, there's hardly a building in downtown that has not been touched by upgrades in things like amenities. So we at, at Newmark and my colleagues have actually put this together. They put together 18 elements of a building that tenants have really asked for over the last several years. And, and these are criteria that, that we as, as building managers uh, try to to get to with with ownership's helps. But if you start talking about amenities, we'll talk about some of the simple amenities. Things like large conference facilities, large rooms, small rooms, uh, shared kitchenette areas, uh, cluster seating for breakaway discussions, breakaway meetings, uh, the all important uh, um, the fitness center where uh, everybody it seems uses it to some degree all day, every day. Even some simplistic things like bike storage and, and places where bikers can come in and, and 
change clothes, shower, things of that nature. All of those things a few years ago, even a year ago, pre-COVID, they were going along very, very well. And, and honestly, none of us, and I, I clearly put myself in this category, none of us anticipated an event like this that would all of a sudden stop us dead in our tracks and say, okay, now what? But here's what tenants are saying. Look, we want the amenities. We, we don't want to have 100 people in a 100 seat room. We expect that that amenity will be available, but the rules of using some of these spaces are going to change rather dramatically. Uh, some of my peers in, in downtown Minneapolis have rearranged rooms, taken out chairs. Uh, they've done things to totally turn the amenities side inside out, but to that extent, in a post-COVID world, we need to do that. People will not come back and use amenities unless they feel like they're safe. So uh, most, most building managers, most building owners are going to adapt over time. There's a couple of other things that are going on with amenities centers that are interesting. One of the biggest questions I get, and I get it every single day, what are you going to do to the fitness center to make sure that I don't get sick from the equipment? There's a lot of different things that we can do, but uh, some of the things that we're looking at doing, things like antimicrobial treatment of, of equipment, uh, ultraviolet light, things of that nature, some of it's invisible. And, and some of these things we have, to, we have to convince the tenant population that we are taking steps to keep them safe. We are social distancing fitness equipment. We are treating it in a way where, uh, you know, do you feel compelled to, to wipe the equipment down when you're done with it? Probably don't have to as much when you do an antimicrobial treatment, but there are going to be people that want to see absolute physical evidence on a daily basis that things are going to be taken care of. Uh, even simple things like, like elevators and, and some of the daily operations of the building, high touch point areas of the building will need to be physically uh, dealt with many, many times during the day. And one of the things that tenants are telling us is, we want to see more activity. We want to see more cleaners. We want to see uh, more things happening that we know are going to keep us safe in the building. So we have a lot of great ideas on things that we can do that are uh, somewhat invisible, as I said. Uh, but to that end, we have to find a balance between actually making sure that our cleaning staff is visible. We have to make sure that they're in the right places at the right time. So people are seeing them uh, kick up the activity, if you will. So by and large, I think, Steve, what we're, what we're hearing from the tenants is we aren't going to shy away from the amenities. It might take us a while. It, it might take me a while before I'm going to get back on that treadmill or on that elliptical machine. Uh, you know, I I bike into work every day, but I'm not real sure I want to use that shower. So I, th I think it's going to be like everything else. It's going to be a progression and, and it's going to have to be over a period of time. The position that we're taking and the position that I'm taking with our properties is we expect to be ready uh, really on day one. And although we have not seen a lot of activity here in the first couple of days of the week, we suspect that in the next two to three weeks, we might start to see more people coming in. We want to be ready. We, we don't want to wait. We want to be absolutely positively ready uh, sooner rather than later. That's great. That, that's very helpful, Dave. Thanks. Kevin, so let me go to you. I mean, one of the great innovations in commercial real estate in the last decade or so has been, has been the co-working space idea. This, is, this whole situation has got to present special challenges to your industry. So kind of what are your general thoughts about uh, co-working in the age of COVID and then maybe address some of those same questions that David was just talking about from a multi-tenant building standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate everything everybody said thus far around amenities and the changing of how folks are going to use the office space. Um, I kind of want to hang on to something that uh, Dave said there, which is about safety, right? The number one thing is what can we do to provide safety in, the, in this point? But that's sort of a, a lower hanging fruit. We can also start to address well, what can we do to actually entice our employees back into the office space? Because everybody's touched on it. 
nobody's going to want to come back into the into the office space. They're going to be the stress levels are going to be incredibly heightened on going returning to the office space, and just making sure that the space is clean. Um, that's sort of the, the new baseline, isn't it? Right. That's no longer an additional an amenity. Clean and fit and functional needs to be the new baseline for all office products, including co-working. And if you take the the reputation of co-working is something that I'm going to, that I think is going to change the most over and be impacted the most by sort of this um, this COVID phenomenon, which is previously co-working products were very flimsy, flimsy very flatty largely unused by the, the commercial real estate occupier, largely unused by the legitimate business, mostly used by, you know, folks like myself, sales guys, people who need to get need an office space, um, or very, very young, immature companies. And, you know, landlords were okay with that. The members of the space were kind of okay with that because larger companies were not adopting this space. But now what we're going to see is now companies realize that holy cow, we really cannot plan much further than three months or four months or one year maximum into the future because we don't know when a pandemic might hit. We don't know when we might need to self-quarantine. What this has really magnified to me is that companies' planning horizons are much shorter than they've ever been and are going to continue to get shorter. So now large companies are going to need to adopt a flexible office product like this um, that is provided either by a co-working operator or in tandem with a landlord partnership. Because as these bigger companies start to adopt a flexible product, landlords are probably going to want to participate more. Um, but to get back to sort of the, the crux of the question, which is how are amenities going to be changed, you're going to see um, a sort of natural evolution of the office space that I thought has been coming for a while, which is, if I can make a weird comparison here for the group of 130 of us, you know, if you think of office space almost like a zoo in the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s, right? It was a cage, we brought the tigers, come do your work. But what you started to see in the last 10, 15 years is the zoo has become more of a natural habitat. Well, if you look at a cubicle, if you look at a traditional office space, it's probably the least creative place you'd ever wanna be in your life. Like it's the, mo it's the opposite of what you provide a human being to be productive, to feel encouraged to come to work and to want to leave your safe home in the middle of a pandemic or immediately after a pandemic. So the amenities in the office space are going to change. And rather than saying, okay, well, here's your, your, your less than ideal cubicle, but we've got a ping pong table. This is great. What you're going to see is our amenities are like they've touched on large conference areas with the types of amenities where people can feel inspired to do their best work. Um, you know, webinar conferencing systems and, tele and telecommunication systems that work seamlessly and do not require, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of your meeting time just to set up large open spaces with, natural light so that you can feel creative and feel inspired to go to work. So I think this is a, you know, I, I, I think everyone on this panel has said something similar, which I'd like to point out, which is this isn't something that we haven't seen coming in the last couple of years with the adoption of, you know, the size of the, the generations of workplaces going into the workplace. Um, and, you know, the changing and the shrinking of the terms of uh, the agreements from 10 years to three years to month to month agreements and co-working. Um, but what it has done is, you know, I really love the quote that was on here earlier, which is, um, you know, tomorrow happened yesterday. Everything we thought was going to happen tomorrow has already happened, and now we need to deal with it. How can we do it safely? How can we do it securely? But more importantly, you know, how can we get people to feel like going to the office is now a perk where they can feel creative and empowered rather than an obligation that may not be that safe? Right. Right. Thank you. Well, and that that's a great segue to, to carry and, and sort of the technology aspect of this, uh, the acceleration of the use of technology. I mean, the fact that I'm sitting here on a, uh, working on a laptop would uh, uh, stun the fact, stun my work colleagues, uh, but it's true. I mean, it's, it really has, has been such a quick uh, adoption of technology. So Kerry, I know you reached out to some of your colleagues at 8x8 uh, to talk a little bit about um, are we going to see further innovation in this space or just a continued acceleration of the use of kind of what we're all accustomed to uh, at this point, uh, eight, eight to 10 weeks into this situation. So what are you, what are you thinking? And I know you got a few slides to share with us. I do. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for having me. Uh, if Mary Beth, if you can bring us into that first slide. Uh, so with regard to technology, I reached out to John Larson, 
our director of IT infrastructure at 8x8 in Minneapolis. And I asked him, what does technology look like in the future? How, what advancements are we going to see? And you know, that, that conversation could have led us in a number of different directions, but we were trying to kind of stay focused on our topic today. And what I thought was really interesting is that his feeling is that the innovation that's needed for remote work as it relates to the COVID world um, has actually already been here for a while. It's just that companies were a little bit slow to adopt it. So it's moving from a location centric technology to more of a cloud-based model uh, and those that feature a single platform approach. So these slides contain a lot of information and I'm happy to provide these after the webinar, but he gives us um, some really interesting statistics. And some of this, it's been a long time coming. Some of these statistics are back from 2017. So the technology was there. Next slide, please. And this is, this is the same thing. Um, you know, it's been around for a while. Companies were slow to adopt it probably because either they were already in a contract with certain providers, they maybe already had purchased a bunch of expensive equipment, or you know, maybe it was just fear-based. But um, the transition doesn't need to be difficult and it doesn't need to be expensive. Next slide, please. Great. Any other comments on that? Or that, that's just a good informational slide for folks that we'll, we can provide afterwards, as you said? That's exactly it. Okay. Great. Good. Super. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for reaching out to your colleague to, to present that information. That's very helpful. So Janice, you started this off and created a great framework and all of our panelists have gone deeper on some of the issues that you identified. So let me come back to you and just ask you to reflect on, on, on what you've heard and, and, and maybe talk a little bit about what you think uh, folks will be doing in the, in the immediate term and then longer term as this back to work process really takes hold. Sure, thank you, Steve. And I, I think there's been a lot of great feedback on, on all of this. And I think some of the short term measures, I think what we have to take into consideration is that there isn't a one size fits all. Every business is in a different starting point in terms of their, their layout and their size. There are some businesses that are already embedded in, in private offices. And that's not the solution, by the way, because while it might protect the individual at certain points during the day, when they venture out of their private offices, they need, they still need to follow some of these other protocols that we've talked about, the, the cleaning, the social distancing, the protective equipment, et cetera. And then with regard to environmental Environments that are more open office, I think, from an immediate standpoint and short term, and you know, Dave, uh, Dave and Chris both alluded to some of this, but it's looking at, um, you know, it's looking at the footprint, it's looking at screening, it's looking at um, protocols, how we use meeting spaces, do we use more open meeting spaces? Again, there are a number of things that can be done on a short term basis, but I think it's also good. What we've been asked by our clients is, you know, when you look at companies, they're, whether they're about to remodel, whether they need to relocate, whether their leases is, is coming due in a couple of years, the question that is being asked is what's next? Um, and, and I think, uh, again, there isn't a one size fits all, but that's the analysis I think we need to start thinking about and not just about, well, how do we prepare for the next pandemic? That, of course, is, is, is unfortunate, but it's about how might this change business? Um, we do a lot of surveying. We've served uh, a variety of types of companies and a variety of types of industries. And a couple of things that appear to be commonalities is that those individuals, uh, individuals, well, companies who had individuals who are primarily in the office, I won't say 100%, but primarily in the office, what we found is the majority of those individuals feel like they will work more from home, less from the office in the future, or that they would desire to do so. Um, and there, there are certainly pros and cons. We need to assess the you know, uh, the, the strength of this experiment. There have been a lot of things that have um, not gone so well working from home and many things that have. Um, the other thing is that we found in our survey from, from a what is working standpoint is most, most people feel that they can be 
as productive and that they're able to focus as well at home. And this is assumes that they don't have young kids running around and dogs barking, et cetera. Um, but the couple of areas that have fallen short are, um, you know, no surprise, socialization and collaboration, real collaboration. But the other one is circulation. You know, we're, we're not walking to meetings. We're not walking down the skyway to get our lunch. We're walking 10 feet into the kitchen. So there are things about it, too, that, that for the most part, what we've heard is, yeah, I'm not sure I want to do this full time. I miss those things. I miss socialization we have spent and that's why the amenity centers that's why um, we have um, you know uh, collaboration spaces built into our office environments because we're trying to instill some sort of exchange of information that happens serendipitously um, so I think you know what what we the conversation that we've had and again this is an assessment that each business needs to make um, and it's a conversation that starts it could be surveys that start but the likelihood is that those individuals who have worked for the most part in the office 100% will now likely be um, uh, more split between the office and, and home or wherever that extra workplace is. And then we need to start looking at the impacts on the physical office environment design. Do we have, are we sharing more desks? Do we have micro offices? Um, for companies that now have five foot benching, do they actually need larger workstations? Although I would argue that before we settle on six foot as the ideal social distancing mark, we should probably wait until we figure that out for sure. Um, but again, I think that the, the next step is really assessing what in this experiment has worked and, and, and what might change long term. And obviously along the way, flexibility and fluidity will be very important to the outcome of this. So a couple of things then. Yeah. Well, let me let me build on that and kind of kick back to Kerry really quickly, and then we'll see if if there are uh, questions from the folks tuned in today. And I, we certainly heard the same thing from HR directors that we've been convening uh, that you know remote work, work from home is going to be a, a more significant part of the ongoing work process in in our in our uh, in our nation. Uh, so so Kerry, if that's true. Uh, how does cloud-based technology kind of fit there and what are some of the advantages and how does it really enhance the ability to work from anywhere, including home? Right. Well, the future of workspaces, as everybody is kind of seeing, is leaning towards a more flexible model. You don't necessarily have to be in the office and cloud-based technology is it enables mobility. So that's what allows us to work from anywhere. At 8x8, we have a product called Virtual Office, and that means that our office is available on any device from anywhere, no matter where we're at. Um, you know, when we have the ability to go seamlessly between chat, voice, video, complete video conferencing, that's our contact center. And it's, you know, having that all available on one platform is really, that's what's unique to our product. But that's also having cloud-based applications and utilizing those internally, that's what was a huge advantage for us in transitioning our 1600 person workforce um, to 100% remote, essentially overnight. We logged into our device just like we'd log in from the office and our, our business continuity wasn't disrupted at all. Thank you. Well, Mary Beth, do we have any questions from the folks tuned in? We do, Steve. I'm going to turn my <laughs> video on so you can see me. Oh, I can't. Dana's got to do it. Okay. Um, Scott, Sean, Sean Scott uh, from PCL asked, do elevators, here we go, do elevators become pinch points to a fully operational office tower in COVID-19? Who wants to take that one on? You've got some elevators. Well, Elevators, uh, clearly, linchpin for uh, a lot of things, most of the things that, that happen in a building, especially in a high rise. There has been more discussion and debate about elevators and, and how we're going to treat those when everybody starts coming back. Uh, you know, there are some basic rules that have been set up and have been communicated, uh, even through resources of the CDC, where they have come out and said, you know what, uh, we're recommending no more than four people uh, in an elevator, one in each corner, uh, one individual that is a uh, representative button pusher, uh, so we don't have four sets of fingers going across and, and hitting buttons, uh, 
and and really it's it's a it's a common sense thing we believe uh i had a tenant ask me last week well how are you going to enforce that well it's kind of tough for building management to enforce especially at quarter to eight in the morning when two-thirds of the building is going to want to go up the elevator right uh, we think that there's common sense that needs to come into play. Certainly, we're going to have signage that is going to direct people on how to use elevators. We're going to have graphic signage on how you should stand in an elevator. Uh, I had one of my colleagues across the street suggest that uh, they're thinking about putting a round table in each one of their elevator cars, forcing people into the corners with a bottle of hand sanitizer in the middle. Now, who would have thunk? a year ago that that idea would have been a marvelous idea yeah. uh, but but there has to be to some degree there's got to be common sense in the use of the elevators we cannot make people walk up steps so uh we are going to we're going to assume that that tenants in our buildings are going to uh take the instructions they certainly are going to understand social distancing and i i'm being somewhat facetious but if you don't understand social distancing by now than you've been in a cave or under a rock. So we, we need to plead to the common sense of our tenants and uh, do the right thing. Follow the guidance, follow the signage, uh, follow what we're recommending, and, and we believe that we've got a workable solution. Great. I, th I thought I saw both Chris and Kevin nodding at points along the way. Do either of you have anything to add on that, on that question of elevators? I would I would defer to other uh, design professionals here, but I, I would just say that um, you know I think tenants are going to are going to be more uh, organized than we think. I think you know staggering start times for offices and for yep. people, for teams within offices is going to be important. Um, if there's this flexible workspace, I think where people are spending part of their day uh, working from home in a and a core time in the middle of the day, working with their team and collaborating when they need to be together. Uh, that can help with uh, the really busy times for elevators, but that certainly is elevators and bathrooms in terms of inside the building are gonna be the most challenging things to figure out. Kevin, any thoughts from you? Um, oh, uh, we do have some design folks that probably know a, a lot more than me. Um, I was only thinking one, it's an interesting conundrum, you know, obviously based on the size of the building because the elevators create a pinch point, which also presents an opportunity to do some kind of testing, screening, uh, even a check-in process, et cetera, just to say, I was at this building on this date and I haven't been anywhere where I think I've been, you know, caught the disease or anything, just to have some sort of reference point for any kind of contact tracing. Um, but I also, I uh, was not along with something that David said, but that's now escaping me. Um, oh, around common sense. Right. It, it's like it's we've been we've all been in quarantine for two months. The news cycle is in, is inescapable. Right. It's almost it's on the building owners to provide the ability to maintain social distancing. It's on the co-working operators to provide the ability to maintain social distancing and have the signages and, and you know do our part. But it's also, you know, it's no different. I live in Philadelphia here. A week into quarantine, it was very strange to see people wearing a mask on the street. But now when I go on the street and I see people who are not making wearing masks, everybody who's wearing a mask is giving them the same evil, dirty look. Like, what are you doing? So we need a little bit of reliance on like self-policing, common sense, et cetera. But it doesn't take away the fact that operators, building owners also do need to present the ability to maintain social distancing through security guidelines, maybe suggesting shifts working like David started to, or Chris started to uh, allude to, things like that. And I understand there's nothing like an evil, dirty look in Philadelphia to get your attention. So, <laughs> I ha I had to say that I'm in, that I'm a native Philadelphian living in Philly <laughs> here uh, because of the the bitter rivalry between our football teams over the last exactly couple of years. exactly. <laughs> so, Mary Beth, I think we had another question come in on on another shared space that'll be challenging, which which are restrooms. True. So um, they're interested in hearing your thoughts. Uh, probably you, Steve, putting you on the hot seat. Um, about um, how to make those public spaces safe as well, going from this, you know, from transit on a sidewalk and a skyway, et cetera. You're putting me on the hot seat on that one? Sure. You're, you're on the restroom. <laughs> he hot wants seat. to pick that up. <laughs> I'm going to maybe pass that on. Janice, is that something that's come up to DLR our group and in, in terms of your clients and, and your thoughts? Well, not so much the, the, the train transportation, although it's been absolutely a topic and, you know, of, of 
from our employee perspective is is like I think it was Chris who said earlier, there is reluctance in, in taking public transportation to the office. But I do think in terms of, of the public walkways, skyways, restrooms, I think they're going to need to follow some of these same protocols yeah. in terms of uh, sanitization and air filtration and, you know, uh, you know, public restroom domain, um, you know, it, it, it will, it, there's, there's definitely a common sense component to this. Um, and, and, you know, you, if you do not have someone standing at each restroom to police the occupancy, you can post the occupancy, but in the end, people will make their decisions. Um, I think we've had, uh, m you know, more interaction with, um, you know, the buildings themselves and what do they do to the, the fitness centers and the amenity centers and how are we going to subtly change these day one. Um, and, and, it's, and it is signage, not that we all want to see this or hear this, but it's posting certain um, uh, signage and occupancies and capacities in places like restrooms, et cetera. Great. Carrie, let me go to you because you've been on, on those calls with other, with HR leaders and office managers. You're going to be on the front line of, of uh, uh, encouraging common sense behavior. Uh, what are you hearing from your colleagues as they think about coming back to an office? We've talked a lot about what we can do to make it safe, but kind of what, what are you hearing from the folks that you work with at 8x8? You know, interestingly enough, we just got our survey results back. Uh, we had sent out a survey at the beginning of the week to assess readiness and kind of see where people were, are, where are they feeling? Are they ready to come back? And it was, um, so all of the information was sorted based on location. And the folks in Minneapolis, I would say, um, a lot of them would come back if they were asked to. They don't necessarily feel 100% comfortable coming back. Then, you know, quite a bit smaller portion uh, is really excited to come back. And then just a very small portion of those people uh, just don't want to come back at all. I think about 30% of people don't, you know, they just want to work remote forever. But the biggest concern, in the, and I, I noticed it in the comments, was the biggest concern is transportation. And getting back to work and how am I going to get there? I used to take the bus, but now I don't feel safe taking the bus or I don't feel safe taking the train. And, you know, those people aren't people who are, have been paying for parking. So they're not accustomed to absorbing, absorbing some of those costs, although that's certainly their preference at this point. So transportation is a huge barrier to reentry for us. Well, listen, I think we probably should wrap it up. Uh, again, thank you to all of our panelists and especially uh, to DLR for sponsoring this event. It's been a rich conversation, a lot of great information shared. I, I think if folks are interested in receiving the slides that you saw, particularly Chris and uh, Carrie's, just let us know. Mary Beth, we can, I think you've posted some of that information, but you can always email Mary Beth and we'll make sure you get those, get those slides. A recording this uh, panel will be on our YouTube page, as I mentioned earlier. And you can also follow us uh, on our website and, and social media channels for notifications of future events, some of which you are helping us shape through the input to the earlier poll questions. So uh, thank you very much again to all the panelists. Thank you for all, all who tuned in this afternoon. And uh, as always, stay safe and engaged and uh, we'll see you when we can see you. Thank, thank you, for, you for hosting, Steve, and for the downtown council for putting this on. Appreciate our, it. Our, our pleasure, our pleasure, really important stuff. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.